Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And a lot of people ask me that question. Why do you say good morning, good afternoon, and evening? Because that's what it is in the world. And you can watch at any time on www.biblediscoverytv.com. This is Quick Study Television, a program that takes you through the Bible, weekend edition. So happy weekend. It's good to have you here. <laughs> now, you studied some things. What did you study? I did. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the ancient city of Ur, the supposed uh, hometown of Abraham. Ur of Chaldees. Wow, that's amazing. All right, well, look for that. Ryan, what did you study today? Well, today we're talking about cloning dinosaurs. Is that even possible? Cloning dinosaurs. I don't know, but man, if they can clone things, they're going to get ready to do a dinosaur. I tell you what, I, I don't know about that. Anyway, later on in the teaching segment, we're going to be talking about this. The son comes, and that is Isaac. Isaac is born to Abraham, who's 100 years old. That and more still to come. You and I are going to be taking a look at a very ancient city. We're going to be taking a look at the city of Ur. Now, the Bible claims that Abraham was a native of Ur, and God called him to come out from his country, out from his city, away from his family, uh, and God would bless him and give him instruction. So today, you and I are going to be taking a look at this early history of Abraham's life. During the lifetime of the biblical patriarch Abraham and his sons, a noteworthy man seized the thrones of the cities Ur and Uruk. Abraham, who had been living in Ur, left at God's command during a time period of invasion and turmoil for the cities of Mesopotamia, including Ur. By doing this, Abraham avoided both a political takeover and also the last period of significant advancement for the city of Ur. After Abraham's departure, a rebellion had begun in the cities of ancient Mesopotamia against the invading people group that had been imposing on them. The man who would lead Ur through this was Ur-Namu. Ur-Namu was made the overseer of Ur by his father-in-law, the king of Uruk, after he had freed both cities from the rule of invaders. As soon as he had his chance, Ur-Namu murdered his father-in-law and took both thrones. Uruk and Ur were his, both powerful cities, both free from invaders for the first time in many years. This is when and where the archaeological record really begins to hand us interesting glimpses into the life of Ur. After establishing and extending his hold, Ernamu began the building projects that he is famous for today. He built temples in various cities throughout Mesopotamia, one of which yielded a bronze dedication figurine of himself in its foundation. He reconstructed old roads, rebuilt crumbled walls, and his man-made canals brought fresh water back into cities that gave tribute. But perhaps his most intriguing achievement, at least for us today, was his law code. It exists in our day only as fragmentary pieces of stone, yet was written to bolster support for this usurper king. By writing a law code, Ernamu could claim goodness and become, at least in show, the protector of his citizens. By writing a legal code, Ernamu provided for us a background of legal culture against which we can compare and contrast the law code of the Hebrew Bible. Isn't it interesting when uh, we are able to go back into the pages of history and take a look at uh, the the birthplace or, or this hometown, at the very least, of Abraham? I mean, it, it just fills in a lot of what the Bible doesn't mention. Uh, and, you know, the Bible cannot be an exhaustive account of the history of every single person that it records. You know, it's it's more of a highlight reel. I say I say that a lot. If you watch Quick Study, you'll hear me say a lot. It's more of a highlight reel. It edits out other parts of history that aren't need to know information simply for the space saving nature of that 
and keeping um, the, the, the narrative, the storyline going. It's telling us a history. It's an edited highlight reel of time, uh, giving us very specific history. And this history is teaching us theology. It's teaching us about God, about how God interacts with humanity. That's one of the main purposes of the Bible. It's revealing the story of salvation from Adam and Eve all the way through Jesus Christ to Revelation. Uh, so we, it's really good to keep that in perspective, the big picture perspective as we focus and zero in as well on uh, micro uh, pictures of what's going on. And, and this uh, taking a look at Ur is one of these scenarios, how it may not have been a very good political situation when Abram left. So it makes sense that God would have called Abram out from that culture at that very time. One of the challenges of the Bible is understanding what the Lord does with our bad decisions. The Lord uses them. Ishmael was born as a result of a bad decision by Sarah and Abram. God did not throw Ishmael away. God doesn't throw people away. Instead, because he was the son of Abram, God made him head over the nation. That, of course, is Genesis chapter 21, verse 13. But listen. What is striking about this message is that God did not reject Sarah's claims against Ishmael as unacceptable, even though Abram sort of desired him to do so. God told Abraham to listen to Sarah and send Ishmael away. God would take care of him. Now, faith works when we listen to what God says and not to what we want to do. Now, this is true, faith in God, that's what it is. When we see this working in the Bible, it is easy reading. But when we begin to understand this meaning in our lives, that's the challenge. Genesis 21, verses one through 12. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was one hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. So the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. Genesis 21, verses 1 through 12. Well, this is a fascinating study today as we look at this. Uh, we are in Genesis and we're going through the Bible. We're seven days into the year and it is exciting. I use that word a lot. Interesting, I use that word a lot. Fascinating, I use that word a lot. And somebody wrote to me and they said, man, you use a lot of words like that. What's your, well, because I'm excited. And the word of God is real. More relevant today than it has ever been. 
Very, very important. Now, if you don't have your Bible guide, why not? Get your Bible guide out and write to us and send an offering in any amount. We'll help you. We'll send it to you at the beginning of every month. Use the U.S. address. Use the Canadian address. Use the British address. But here's a good one for you. You can do this right now. If you have the internet, go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. Biblediscoverytv.com. When you go there, click on Donate. Make an offering in any amount. And when you do so, it'll take you to the page afterwards, which is where the guide is, all in PDF files. It's beautiful and you'll love it. Now, this is important because we put the guide together every month to help you understand. And we're looking at works of faith today. Works of faith. How does faith work in my life? I call this the sun rises. Ishmael is out. The sun rises. Ishmael is out. We read Genesis chapter 21 to chapter 23. And this is amazing. We're looking at Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 to 12. Fascinating. Now, when we look at this, we need to understand that God is speaking today. He's speaking to you, and he's speaking to me. Let us look at this together so we can understand it. Here's Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 to 5. And the Lord visited Sarah. The Lord visited her as he said and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. That's amazing. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set of time which God had spoken to him. Now think about that. God did what he said. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And then... Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, when he was eight days old. Now that's important, eight days old. As God had commanded him. Now Abram was 100 years old. That is an old person. When Isaac was born to him. This father is absolutely amazing. The son of Abraham and Sarah was born in their old age. God did what he said and he would do. God did what he said he would do. This is important. See, God spoke to Abram and Sarah and then changed his name, Abraham, father of exalted many. And so God then does what he says he's going to do. Now, let me tell you something. He was an ancient man. I mean, a hundred year old. How would you like to be a hundred years old and be a father? That'd be kind of hard, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, it would be. So, I mean, I'm 55 and I can't think of, I can't imagine that. But anyway, the, the idea is that God did what he said to Abram. Now that's fascinating. Fascinating. Because as God says it, we listen to it, we hear it. But we oftentimes become impatient. We shouldn't be impatient because God is doing things in our lives, making us ready, getting us ready. And you know what? Ishmael was 13 at this point. And so Isaac is born and weaned and all of that. Now look at this, ch chapter 21, verse 6. It says, and Sarah said, God has made me laugh and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abram that Sarah would be a nursing children? Can you believe that? For I have borne him a son in his old age. She is absolutely amazed by this. See, Sarah articulated her amazement as God set the birth of Isaac in motion, beloved. We must praise God and give him glory when we see his miracle working power. His miracle working power. If we don't, we're going to go crazy. We need to praise God. Psalms tells us 150 times, praise the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And this is important. And his courts with praise. So we need to understand that we need to give God praise. Otherwise, we're going to go crazy. God does amazing things. And he's doing amazing things right now upon planet Earth. I, I want to tell you that there's a great deal of people focused on all of these other things, you know, with with the, the social networks and with things happening around the world and taking place. But we need to stay as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to focus on God Almighty because God is doing some amazing things. And we see Israel and we see the nations, we see things happening. We are in the end of time and God is doing something amazing. We need to praise God all the time. 
And we need to let him know that. Very important. Okay. Now let's go to Genesis 21, 8 to 12. Listen carefully. So the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abram, scoffing, scoffing. And therefore, she said to Abram, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely Isaac. That's amazing. Now, verse 11 said this, and this is something we need to think about. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abram, to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad, because of the lad, or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Now that is, you know, here again, we have a stunning admission of, of reality. God did not chide Sarah, this is important, about her anger towards Ishmael. We must not cut short someone sharing with God their anger at our fault. Only God can deal with it. See, there was a guy who came to me and he said, you know, Rod, I prayed, you know, I prayed, I did what you said, I prayed, I prayed. I said, okay, well, how'd you pray? Well, you know, I kind of prayed, you know, hardly. And I said, you know, I kind of prayed. I, I said, you know, God, you know, I, and then I, I cussed at him and I swore at him and I yelled at him. I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, he, he kind of filled me with his spirit. Really? Yeah, he did. And he told me that I need to continue in this way because there's nothing we can say to God that will be offensive to him if we are honest in our hearts, if our hearts are honest before God, and we say, Lord, this is killing me right now. This is killing me right now. Help me. Then God will come into our hearts. He'll come into our life and he will change everything. Very important. We must be honest in prayer with everything, beloved. Very important. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television, and it is good to be going through the Bible as we study on and we learn some things, and we'll be talking about a lot more as the year goes on. When we get into the Bible, get into Exodus and Leviticus, that is still to come. It is very, very exciting. But right now, Ryan is here to tell us what he's done. Ryan? Today we're talking about one of my very favorite topics, dinosaurs. That was back in the 90s when the first Jurassic Park movie came out and it told the story of cloning dinosaurs from the DNA found in dino blood in preserved mosquitoes. Well, last weekend we began to research this topic to discover if cloning dino DNA could be a realistic scientific venture. But before that question could even be answered, we ran into a major problem. See, what's been discovered in real-world tests is that DNA could only last for thousands, not millions of years. So based on the timeline of evolution and Jurassic Park, there wouldn't even be any DNA left to clone. We also discovered that a lot of dinosaur DNA has actually been found in the real world, meaning that it cannot be millions of years old. This is a real challenge for evolution. But today we answer the question everyone wants to know. Can dinosaurs be cloned from the existing DNA that's been found? Let's study.
Jurassic Park, the famous 1993 blockbuster hit, is a fictional story in which scientists collect dinosaur DNA from blood contained in fossilized mosquitoes that had supposedly bitten them millions of years ago. We have made living biological attractions so astounding that they'll capture the imagination of the entire planet. The scientists then use the DNA to clone the dinosaurs back into existence. The obvious question is if there could be any scientific reality to this fictional story. Unfortunately for Jurassic Park and for Evolution, the real-life tests revealed that DNA can only last for a fraction of the supposed 65 million years since dinosaurs last existed. So based on this timeline, there would not even be any DNA to clone. To make things worse for evolutionists, dinosaur DNA has been found in real life. Interestingly, famous paleontologist Jack Horner, who served as scientific advisor for the Jurassic Park movies, though offered a substantial amount of money, refused a carbon-14 test on a T-Rex bone that was supposedly 68 million years old. This is because he realizes that any presence of carbon-14 means the bone is younger than 100,000 years old. This confirmation would seriously undermine the evolutionary paradigm. Fortunately, another paleontologist, Otis Klein, and his team recovered fossils from a triceratops and a hadrosaur from the same place that the T-Rex fossil was found. And unlike Horner, he was eager to test the fossils for carbon-14. They were tested by Geochron Laboratories and the University of Georgia Isotope Center. These two internationally recognized laboratories both tested the fossils so that the results could be independently confirmed. Indeed, the results were in. Both confirmed the presence of carbon-14. This means that these fossils can only have a maximum age of thousands of years. While these discoveries completely bust the movie myth and undermine evolution as a whole, the question still remains whether or not cloning dinosaurs is a possibility. Dr. Jonathan Sarfati believes that even with the fossil's young age, that it is very unlikely because the DNA is extremely fragmented. Scientists at one point had high hopes in cloning a mammoth, However, it was found that its DNA was so fragmented that the longest sequence had only 100 out of the billions of base pairs needed for cloning. Sarfati points out that the problems would be exasperated for dinosaur fossils, because dinosaur fossils were the result of the flood, while mammoth fossils are centuries younger, near the close of the Ice Age. It therefore seems unlikely that Jurassic Park will ever become a reality, even with the fossil's young age. Now, even though the dinosaur DNA is extremely fragmented, this hasn't stopped evolutionists like Jack Horner, who I mentioned in the segment, from trying it. But you ask, where are they going to get the missing DNA from? Well, Horner, along with some other evolutionists, believe that since dinosaurs and birds are related according to their worldview, it should be possible to grow a dinosaur from a bird embryo. It's true. Well, believe it or not, they're experimenting with chicken embryos to create the animal, which they have dubbed Chickenosaurus. Now, in my opinion, this is a great example of how your worldview can really take you down a scientifically bad path. See, there's absolutely no real life support that dinosaurs and chickens are related. These experiments are based purely upon the philosophy of evolution. However, according to the Bible, God made all the animals according to their kind. And this is exactly what we're seeing in science. Chicken asaurus, Ryan. Okay, well, that's very interesting because the question with, with me it comes up here, <laughs> and it, it, it's fascinating mm -hmm. using a chicken yeah. to grow a dinosaur. Uh, and, 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 you know, God created, according to Genesis at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, in the first chapter, created the cattle and all that, and the beast, okay? But, but we're actually able to take DNA and do this. And that is stunning because the question I would ask is who made the DNA? Yeah, well, it's true. DNA does not spontaneously form as you mentioned earlier. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, you know I, I like what Brandon said. Brandon's over here and he said, you know, well, it's easier, Dad, if you just don't think about it. And he was teasing because he's based on, you know, based on evolutionary thinking. And it's not that, that we're saying, you know, anything about the person who believes that because it's been taught, you know, evolution's yeah. been taught. It's very deeply entrenched into pretty much every uh, science, even historical science. It's right. I, I, right listen, I, I remember when I was uh, in high school going down the hallway and seeing a picture on the wall yeah. of the evolution of a, a small monkey 
and then to an ape, and then to a human being. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, that's strange. And I asked my pastor at that time, well, what's the deal with that? And he didn't know. Yeah. You know, he was totally ignorant. And um, this idea of things changing into other things, that idea of change is not biblical. That idea of mutation, not biblical. God created everything according to its kind. In other words, the DNA is restricted to its kind. Yeah. And that's really important. So my question really relates to uh, how do you, you know, how do you deal with this today when you've got all this going on? How do you deal with this related to the Bible? What do we do? What do we tell people? And what do we say? Mm -hmm. What? That's the that's the question. Does yeah. anybody here have an answer? We to got, that? You got to do a, re a lot of research. I mean, we have great, uh, you know, when when you were in youth group, when you were that young, there wasn't um, exist. There didn't exist as many ministries that deal with this issue as do today. I mean, we've got answers in Genesis in the states. We have Creation Ministries International in Canada and Australia. Uh, so there's ICR some. There's some and, yeah, yeah, there's tons. I'm just just naming a few of them, but there's a ton of ministries now uh, because the scientific information, the more uh, testing and experimentation and theorizing that is going on, uh, there's there's a lot of information out there on both sides of the aisle. So it's it's really yeah, there is a lot of information out there, and I need to tell you that it's really important because as you begin to think this through and as you begin to understand it, there's science everywhere. And everybody's saying science this and science that, and we did this and we did that. We really don't know. But what the Bible does is the Bible begins to put into our minds the way to think. And I would like to remind you that we believe and we understand because we've seen it, the evidence of it with uh, books like uh, Donald Chittick and some of the others about ancient technology, we've seen that we were very smart and we have descended. And this is interesting. The rise of technology is relatively recent and it's quickly done. But we need to understand what God says. Now, if you are somebody who is caught into all of this with uh, evolution and science and all of that, but you know there's something wrong, you know that this is not right, then you need to come to Jesus Christ and make yourself Lord or make himself Lord of your life because that's important. When you do that, then he begins to help you understand things. That's the best way to do this. And so say, Jesus Christ, be my Lord. Today, I confess you as a Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin and help me today.